place is empty. No more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors in the courtroom. No debate. Work on earth has been suspended as the king comes through the gate. Happy faces line the hallways, those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged, hand in hand stand all aglow, who were crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments white as snow. I can hear the chariots rumble. I can see the marching throng. The flurry of God's trumpets spell the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding. Heaven's choir is now assembled. Start to sing amazing grace. Oh, the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding and We are so glad to be singing with you this morning and to be together in worship. Worship is a powerful weapon in this fallen world that we live in. And I don't know how you came in today, but I know all of us have things on our minds. We have uncertainties we're facing. We have things that we're just not sure about. And so those things weigh on us. But we know that we have hope and we have victory in Jesus. And you know, as followers of Jesus, we know that we're not promised to win every earthly battle. I know I've lost my fair share. I know things have not always gone the way that I would have hoped, but I know, we know because of the word of God that he has promised that he's got us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And in him, we have the ultimate victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to worship our way through this morning, and we're going to give God the glory because he holds the victory. Let's sing, sing it, see a victory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. 
Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants Cause I know how this story ends I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's sing this together. He turns it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, you do, Lord. You take what the enemy and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. We want to hear your God stories. If you have them, we want to hear from you because um, they're, they're a testimony to all of us. And so we're going to continue to worship with one of my very, very favorite songs. This is a powerful song about God's goodness. It's called Goodness of God. And we're going to sing and lift our voices together and just tell God how good and faithful he is. Let's stand and sing. love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. 
I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Sing it out all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. Of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. church. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise forever 
that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Sing this out together. Now, when I realized, and I'm so thankful for the focus that we're having in Bible study and in small groups and in our worship services, and I'm thankful to the Lord and I'm thankful to Scott, and I want all of us to really embrace that, to digest it. But when I looked at multiplication, I thought, okay, I'm totally in favor of that because that means bearing fruit. That means reaching out in the name of Jesus Christ. That means seeing God's kingdom grow and reach people that are lost, doing what God has asked us to do. And then I thought about Scripture because, you know, people say sometimes that I do a nice job with what I do from up here. And I say always, well, I've got good material to work with because I want to go to God's Word always and to see what He's saying so that he can say that to me and he can say that to you. And so as I thought about that for today's sharing with you, I thought about several different places in Scripture, but I always came back to the same place that I've been several times before. And I said, Lord, I've already said a lot of things about this passage of Scripture. I've already talked to our congregation. And, you know, it's that part of me that says, well, okay, you need to be original. Well, okay, God's in charge, not Don Solomon. And so I kept coming back to one. I, I, I just feel like, and there's so many powerful things in Scripture, but I kept coming back to one of the most powerful two chapters that I can think of sometimes, and that's Acts 1 and 2. And so today, we're going to look at it again. But I've looked at it for the last several days with prayer and going deeper into what Acts 1 and 2 says to us. And so I want to share that with you, and I want to ask you, number one, you notice there's no screen behind me. You get to see out the beautiful window. There's no scripture on the screen, except we're going to do a Bible study, which I love doing. So that means that you need to pick up your Bible if you have it close by. Or for those people that are so inclined, if you have a Bible app on your phone, that does work because that is God's Word there on that little electronic thing that you have in your purse or pocket. Or if you want to reach and pick up one of the pew Bibles that's right in front of you, 
But I want to ask you to go with me into this very powerful statement in the book of Acts, chapters 1 and 2. And we are going to look at some of the implications that are there and some of the messages and some of the lessons for you and me and for this church or for any Christian individual family or church family. And there are some things here that I have never thought about. And I have looked at this passage so many, many times. But I want you to realize that we're going to look at some of the supernatural experiences that led up to the things that happened in Acts 1 and 2. We're going to look at some of the promised expectations. We're going to look at a spirit of obedience that was about some of the people that were involved in this passage of scripture and we're going to look at some of the unity the the togetherness that they experienced as followers and as seekers of Jesus Christ and then we're going to look at the constant prayer the experience of prayer that these folks had together and so if you'll just join me uh, I'm going to read part of it I'm going to comment on part of it but we're going to start right with the first verse in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, verse 3, it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that they were alive. Now, after his suffering, what does that mean? It means after his crucifixion, the primary suffering that Jesus Christ. But we're about to look here at this wonderful supernatural experience that these people are about to have. And now these people are seeing a man that was dead in the tomb, but now he is alive. Now, I want you to realize that all of these characteristics that we're talking about are foundational for bringing about the, the presentation of the Holy Spirit and for Peter's sermon and for 3,000 people to be saved and for the church, the church to be born because this day of Pentecost in Acts 1 and 2 is the birthday of the church. And so here we are looking at the fact that these people are experiencing something supernatural, something that I've never experienced. I've never looked and physically seen a man that was dead, buried in a tomb, and now is standing before us speaking words to us. But that is what Jesus did because it says he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So for 40 days, Jesus Christ came to his people and taught them about the kingdom of God. A special, supernatural, unbelievable experience, but it impressed these people. Now, that's not the only thing in this passage where he is going to show and the Spirit of God is going to show them that it's supernatural. It is something beyond the natural. It's beyond human expectation. Because on down in verse 9, after Jesus had spoken to them, and we're going to go back and pick up that in a moment, but after he had spoken to them, verse 9 says, after he said these things, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, as I've said sometimes, I really want to think about that in an experiential kind of way. What I mean by that is I would like for you and I to think about what it would be like if we were standing there listening to Jesus Christ. He's giving us instructions, which we're going to talk about in a moment. We are already seeing this supernatural experience, and now Jesus Christ raises up and it says that he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Supernatural? Yes, indeed. And they were looking, verse 10, 
They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white, (laughs) the supernatural continues, two men dressed in white stood before them and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now that's one of the promised expectations. Please remember, part of what I'm saying is all of these things that we're looking at right here are foundational and they're cultivation for the Holy Spirit coming. The Holy Spirit has not shown himself yet. That's coming in chapter 2. But this that these folks are experiencing is foundational cultivation for the Holy Spirit coming. And so there are promised expectations here. Because go back to verse 4. We see something that Jesus is saying to the people. It says, on one occasion, while he, Jesus Christ, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, my Father's promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist, excuse me, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a promised expectation. Think about when you get a promise. When somebody that you love and trust promises you something. Aren't you expectant of that coming? You trust that person. You believe that they promise that they're going to be there or they're going to do thus and so or they're going to take care of you in this way. You trust that. Well, here Jesus is saying that you're going to get a power that he has spoken about. Now, has he spoken about it? We sang a song earlier about breathe on me the breath of God. Well... Do you remember the night that Jesus was crucified? He appeared to the disciples in in an upper room. Now remember, the disciples were running scared. They had seen Jesus hang on a cross. And Jesus appeared to them. And what did Jesus say? He said, I'm breathing on you, and I'm going to breathe on you the breath of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has spoken about the Holy Spirit. He's taught his disciples. And now he is promising them that if they will follow his command, they're to wait for the gift that the Father has promised, which he has spoken about, and that is that they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now remember, this is in chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is coming in chapter 2. But this is a promised expectation. Now, for just a moment... Please think about what Jesus has promised you and me. What did we just celebrate a moment ago? The king is coming. Now, do you believe that? I hope so. Is that a fantasy? No. And we believe that because we trust the one who has promised that. Well, that's what these people are going through. And that's part of the lesson for you and me as we gather here today, is that when Jesus promises something, it is fact. Now, sometimes when you and I promise something, we might get a little shaky. Now, i got a little clue for you. In loving relationships and in family relationships and in church relationships, when you promise something, then leave, live up to your promises. Because what does that produce? Trust. What is trust? Lots of things, but it's also foundational for secure relationships. So Jesus is to be trusted, and here he is promising and creating expectation. And then there's another place here in verse 8. He says that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Okay, there's the Holy Spirit promised again. Jesus is saying, you can trust this, you can depend on this, that the Holy Spirit is going to be a part of your life. And so, supernatural experiences, promise expectations, 
And then part of this foundational for the Holy Spirit coming is that the people, now listen carefully, the people have to be obedient. Now what does that mean? You know the, you know the word. You know the concept. My question to myself and to us is, do we live up to it? Are we, am I, are you, is our church, is your family, is the church of Jesus Christ, are we obedient to what he says? This obedience is all through here because he gives commands. We've talked about that. And a moment ago, I just said he gave a command for them to not leave Jerusalem. Now, why is that such a big command for these people? Because nobody lived in Jerusalem. <laughs> they lived in another part of the promised land of, of Israel. Nobody lived in Jerusalem. They were all guests there. And Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem. Well, what would you do? I want to go home. <laughs> uh, I, I need to sleep in my bed. Uh, I know what my house looks like. I'm comfortable when I go home. Yes, thankful we have homes. But what if Jesus comes along and says, don't go home. What? Jesus, are you crazy? Yeah, sometimes we might think that. But he says, don't go home. Or go here, or go there, or do this, or do that. Who's in charge of your life? <laughs> now, I've said this, and it's not easy for us but we don't belong to ourselves. Now, if you disagree with me, please come and talk to me sometimes because that's a tough concept. But you don't belong to yourself, and I don't belong to me. And I've been bought with a terrible price, and it's called the cross of Jesus Christ. Same with you. That's part of why you're sitting here today. Well, then, since we don't belong to ourselves, who do we belong to? We call Jesus Lord and Master. Well, that's why he gives commands. And we are to be what? Obedient. That means that when he shows us something, tells us something, teaches us something, or calls us to do something, then we are to do that. And in doing that, we are honoring our Lord and Master, and also, guess what? Then we are creating peace in ourselves. I promise you, one of the things that I deal with so much in counseling and in ministry is Christian people that do not live in obedience. Because what does that produce? That produces what I call a tug-of-war. Because you and I belong to Jesus Christ, and we are to live accordingly. And we are to obey. And then when we don't obey, there is a tug-of-war. Now, the end result of that tug-of-war is a concept called guilt. Mm. Yeah. Because if your values and my values indicate that we're to be this way or to do this and to be obedient to our Lord and Master, and then we don't, then there is guilt that is the result of that. And you know what happens next? You end up in my counseling office. <laughs> and I would love to be put out of a job. And I mean that. I know that that will never happen, unfortunately. But I want us to be obedient, and that's what these people were going through. They were being called to obedience. And they were to stay in Jerusalem. And they were to be his witnesses. You will be. Verse 8. There it is again. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. That is a command. I've said that. But the command brings about obedience. Obedience brings about fruit bearing or multiplication or being witnesses to the Lord, for the Lord. And so here, 
again, building up to the Holy Spirit coming into their lives, they are being obedient. Now, I also want you to realize that these folks, there was a whole group of people that had been following Jesus, and they were experiencing this other concept called unity. Now, I know, and you know, that in Scripture there are all sorts of references to Christian people being unified. That means being of one mind and one effort, and they, they, they were operating here in the first chapter of Acts. They were operating in a unified spirit as they were serving the Lord, as they were learning, as they were moving toward the Holy Spirit. And after they saw Jesus go up into the sky, what did they do? Remember, Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem. Do not leave Jerusalem. Well, in verse 12, it says, Then they, that's the whole group, not part of the group, the whole group, then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city, and when they arrived, they, I'm emphasizing they because it doesn't say part of the group. <laughs> it doesn't say a few of them went back to Jerusalem and the rest of the folks went home to Galilee. No. All of them. There were, as best we understand, there were about 120 followers of Jesus Christ at this point. And it says they went back to Jerusalem and when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. This is in verse 13 of Acts 1. And they then, in, in verse 14, they all joined together. They, 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 they were unified. They were not partial. I pray for this church and all churches I would pray for denominations to be unified. And I think it will happen one time. And that's when Jesus comes back, when the king arrives. Because we human beings have, and I hate this, have destroyed the command to be unified. And we have one Lord. And we need to unify under his leadership and his guidance. And let's just do it right here. Because I can't control what happens out there and at other churches and in other denominations. But I, you have given me the privilege of being able to influence you right here. And from scripture I'm saying we are to be unified. And there's no option if, in fact, we're following the Lord. And that's what these folks did. And they all joined together, and here's the key word there in verse 14, constantly in prayer. We believe, from looking at how the Scriptures put together, that these folks were in prayer together constantly for 10 days. Have you ever been in a 10-day prayer meeting? Maybe we need a 10-day prayer meeting. <laughs> Maybe we need to be in prayer constantly as Christian men and women seeking the Lord and following Him. Remember, this is all a part of the foundation. They've had supernatural experiences. They've had promised expectations. They have been obedient to, to the Lord's commands. They have been unified and they have been together constantly in prayer. And then what happens in chapter 2? The Holy Spirit comes. <laughs> That's what Jesus promised. Now it's been 10 days, and they've been praying for this. Don't you think they got tired of praying? Say yes, because they were human beings, and you and I are human beings. And I'm sorry, I love the Lord, and I love to pray, but I would get tired of praying for 10 days. Yeah, let's be honest. But they prayed for 10 days. And I'm sure they said, Lord, you told us the Holy Spirit was coming. When is it going to happen? 
I'm getting tired. I want to see something that you've been promised. Well, I don't understand all that, but God's in charge of his timing, not me. God's in charge of his timing, not you. God's in charge of his timing, not these folks here 2,000 years ago, but they remain constant. That's why Scripture says they prayed together constantly for those 10 days. And then in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Now, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? They get excited and they start declaring the wonderful praises of Almighty God, all these 120 people. They've been in an upper room, they come pouring out, and they, in the day of Pentecost, and it's believed that there were maybe thousands of, of people in Jerusalem. Maybe 50,000, maybe 80,000, who knows. But there were thousands of Jewish followers in the city of Jerusalem. And now all these people of Jesus come pouring out, and they're praising God, and they're hallelujah, and praise the Lord, and wonderful exclamations about God's goodness and about Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what do all of these other people hear? Now, this is an interesting fact right here, and I've never looked at it like this. A lot of people say, well, this, all the people, all the 120 followers of Jesus Christ were speaking other languages. I don't think that's what Scripture says. Let's read it here for a moment. It says, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of this, this is in verse 6 of chapter 2. A crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Each one heard them speaking in his own language. Now, there's a miracle going on here. There is a supernatural experience going on here. But I have realized from studying and thinking about this that the miracle is in the hearing, not the speaking. <laughs> now, there's debate about this, but that just, it says that each one heard them speaking in his own language there in verse 6. Verse 7, utterly amazed, they ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? It's a miracle of hearing. And God is doing something powerful here in the Holy Spirit's presentation. And then in verse 9, it lists 15. Yeah, go on there and count them if you need to, but I'm just telling you there are 15 different nationalities, people from different countries. Look at it in verse 9. Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs, they were all hearing the praises of God from these 120 people, filled with the Holy Spirit, they were hearing in their own language. A miracle. The Holy Spirit has come to declare to the people. Now, this is part of what, about, what is about to happen next. Because what happens next? Peter stands up and he preaches. That's another miracle. And do you realize this? That's why I say this chapter 1 and chapter 2 is just packed. Because preacher, uh, Peter had never preached a sermon before. He had never gotten up in front of a crowd. And now he's in front of thousands of people. And not just fishermen. These were thousands of Jewish educated followers of Almighty God in the Jewish faith. And they were there for the festival of Pentecost. And Peter is preaching and then the wonderful miracle of people being saved. We know that story. I've preached on that story. But this is what happens when people are given a foundation and they accept it as these people have had. They have been in these supernatural experiences and promised expectations and they've experienced it days and weeks and months really of unity and obedience to who and to whom? To Jesus Christ and to his commands and to his spirit. 
and now they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they are experiencing all this. And then 3,000 people were saved. Now, here's an interesting fact that I want you to grasp and I will move toward concluding here. I promise I'll be through in at least an hour, okay? But the fact is, is that these people, these 120 people, now are seeing 3,000 people saved. Now we've got 3,120 people. Now, there is no way we know who was from all of these different lands, but remember there's maybe 50, 60, 70,000 people in Jerusalem celebrating Pentecost. Now, a portion of those, and they, some people estimate, and it is totally an estimate, a portion of those 3,000 people were from Jerusalem. Some people say maybe 25% of them. So what is that if you do the math? Maybe 750 people from Jerusalem. But that means you've got 2,225 people who are from out of town. And guess what? They didn't get enough traveler's checks to do all this that they're about to do. They were just going to come for a couple of days. And then they were going to do what? They were going to go home. But now they are believers in Jesus Christ. And a lot of us believe, and I believe this, that what happened with these people is that now they are the church. They are the church family. And they are staying in Jerusalem for a period of time. Now, where did these thousands of people stay? Well, if there's 750 people from Jerusalem, it means that there were a lot of houses that were really crowded. Now, I want you to think about that. You got 750 people, you got 2,000 plus people who are from out of town. They're going to move in with you. But now, what are they doing as they move in? What is their lifestyle? This is not a rowdy bunch of folks. These are people that believe in Jesus Christ and have been baptized under the preaching of Peter under the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. And now they are in Jerusalem causing upheaval and havoc. Not in a bad way, in a powerful way. And this is the, the multiplication. We've gone from 120, we now have 3,120. Now they're going to be in Jerusalem for a period of time, and I don't know if it was a week or a year. There's no way to really tell. But I want you to look in chapter 2, and we have studied this, and it is very powerful, and it is what happened to these people that experienced these previous things and in chapter 2 verse 42 through 47 listen carefully they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer devoted that's another word for obedient that's another word for being obsessed with the truth of Jesus Christ and the, the apostles were teaching them about that and now this church that has these 3,000 plus people and they're living all over the place in Jerusalem with other believers, they are devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many, many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. What does that mean? That means that the supernatural experiences are continuing because the Holy Spirit is involved in these 3,000 plus people. And it says, verse 44, all the believers were together. What is that again? That's unity. Do you see how this whole thing is just wrapped up in the principles of Almighty God, which are still the principles by which you and I are to live today that all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and good, they gave to anyone as he or she had needs. Now, what is that? That is ministry. They are taking care of people that have needs. 
that's part of what we're to do now and today. So they are taking care. And then verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily. Yes, the sermon topic, the title today is, is that and the Lord added. Why and how did he add? He didn't come in and just take them by the hand. He worked through 3,120 people and birth the church here in the second chapter of Acts. And he added to their number every now and then? No. No. I wish, I pray. He added to their number daily. Why? Because of all this that we've just been talking about because of all of what the Lord had given, all of what the good Lord had commanded, all of what the Lord had sacrificed, all of what the Lord was teaching the people through the apostles. Jesus is gone. <laughs> but he's not gone. Right? Because he promised. Go back to the 14th chapter of John. And what did Jesus say? He said, I am not going to leave you as orphans. I am going to be here with you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a promise. A promise of expectations. Now is that promise still valid? Is it still in operation today? Is it still calling for obedience and unity and all of these wonderful things that they experienced in the first and second chapter of Acts? Yes, 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 and yes again. Now it's up to me and you if we're going to let the Lord be the Lord and Master. Or are we going to do it our way? I'm sorry, he knows a lot more than I do, folks. <laughs> I'm not sorry that he does, but I'm sorry that I have to hold that before you because I know, and I struggle with it sometimes, I just say, Lord, would you just do it now? Or would you do it this way? And sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. Yeah, because he is Lord and Master. Yes, he is King, and we are his people. And I pray earnestly for you and me, for King's Grand Baptist Church, for all churches, because when we obey and when we serve him according to his way, then there is peace there's joy, and there is fruit-bearing. Call it multiplication. Yes, that's great. Multiplying the kingdom of God. But bearing fruit because of the name and the power and the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.